Uh, hello all and welcome to the Rails board meeting. This is Friday, May 27th, 2022. And I am Tom Stagg, president of the Rails board. And I call this meeting to order at uh, 1010. Uh, in accordance with the Government Emergency Administrative Act, PA 100-0640, the Rails Board of Directors finds an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent and believes it is in the best interest of Rails to hold a virtual meeting to perform essential business. Uh, Emily, will you please call roll? Sure. Everyone hear me? Yep. Sue Busenbark. Here. Ellie Cox. Rosie Camargo. Alice Creason. Here. Robin Hellenthal. Here. Diane Hollister. Here. Chris Kenny. Here. Jennifer McIntosh. Here. Scott Poynton. Here. Becky Spratford. Here. Thomas Stagg. Here. Beth Teppen. Here. Monica Tolva. Alex Vancina. Here. And Karen Voidick. Here. And we have a uh, Thank you, Emily. Karen Voidick said care avoid it. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, the participants will notice that all the Rails Committee and board meetings will now have closed caption settings activated. The captioning will appear on the large main screen of the Rails meeting rooms and can also be activated by users on their laptops. Uh, please let us know if you need any assistance with setting with that setting. Um, at this time, we'll have recognition of guests. Uh, we'll handle guests and public comments at the same time. We'll start here in East Peoria. Hi, Kendall Larson, Rails RSA. I have no comments. <laughs> Thank you, Kendall. Uh, now to the guest in Burr Ridge. So I'm Julie Millebeck. I'm the uh, one of the candidates for Rails Board. Deirdre Brennan, Rails. Monica Harris, Rails. That's it. That's it. Okay. In the meeting room. Um, in the meeting room. Oh. oh. Emily, will you read the names of the guests who are participating via Zoom? Sure. Myself, Emily Feister, Greg McCormick with State Library. Sharon Swanson with Rails, Catherine Hentz from Rails, Ryan Hebel from Rails, Mark Hatch from Rails, Joseph Philippeck from Rails, Layla Heath from Rails, Nancy George from Rails, and Ann Slaughter from Rails. And we also have a gentleman from the Bensonville Public Library. Can you state your name, please. You are muted. Hi there, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Sloan. I'm the uh, new director here at the Bensonville Public Library. Just wanted to uh, come and observe uh, my first first meeting, so. Welcome. Great, welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, we're handling public comments via Zoom or by previous submissions to Emily. Uh, Emily, did you receive any comments? I did not. Uh, if not, does anyone have any public comments this time? Okay, we will now move on to the consent agenda. We have three items on the consent agenda, the adoption of the agenda, the Rails board minutes from April 22, and approval of disbursements for April 2022. Uh, does anyone have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? May I have a motion? And second. Second, second Diane. Somebody just. Oh. So somebody in East Peoria just turned turned on their microphone. I think. Tom, can you talk yeah, again? I to to make sure we don't yeah, have that. Yeah, I muted it because we were getting the, the background loop with the ring. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thanks, Kendall. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, this is Becky. I'll move that we approve the consent agenda. This is okay, Karen. Thank, I second. Okay, Karen. Thank you. Uh, Emily, will you please call roll? Sue Busenberg. Yes. Alice Creason. Yes. Robin Hellenthal. Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. Chris Kenny. Yes. Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Peggy Spratford. Yes. Beth Teppen. Yes. Alex Vincina. Yes. Darren Voidick. Yes. And Thomas Stagg. Yes. Uh, now we have Sharon with the financial report. Good morning, everyone. I know that we're all anxious to start our holiday weekend, so I'll keep my presentation limited to the highlights from April. The um, April 30th unassigned general fund cash and investment balance of $20.2 million would fund approximately 21 months of operations. Revenues through April of um, a little over $10 million were approximately $190,000 below budget. And this was primarily from below budget APC um, grant payments received through um, April 30th. But since I've written my report, Rails received the final remaining payment from the um, fiscal year 2022 APC grant for the federal or LSTA portion. Um, which is um, $1,936,144. The comptroller's office literally processed this payment within three days. Um, so payments are continuing, continuing to wow. move very efficiently from that office. Investment income uh, was $26,802 through April, which is um, $2,812 above the budgeted amount, the first time that we are above the budgeted amount. Um, in February, the money market rates uh, rose above the 0.14% uh, rate that we had budgeted. So they are, and they are continuing to rise um, ever since. The Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates at each of their uh, remaining five meetings over the course of calendar year 2022, uh, with the first increase, as we know, of 0.25% in March and a 0.5% increase this month in May, and another anticipated 0.5% increase in July. Their expected um, goal is a total rate of between 2 and 2.5% by the end of the calendar year, and they're on track to, to reach that at this point. Uh, they do need to be cautious, however, by um, not to raise interest rates too quickly, uh, which might throw the country into a recession. Uh, the fair market value of Rails's series of treasury notes, um, which we invested in earlier this calendar year, decreased by $32,365 during the month of April due to um, the rising interest rates that I just mentioned. Um, these notes will gradually increase to the fair market value of $3,890,000 as the investments approach their individual maturities. And our first of these um, four maturities will occur in July. Expenditures through April of a little over $10.5 million were approximately $453,000 below budget. Um, nearly all major cost categories were under the budget amounts with the exception of supplies, postage and printing expenditures, vehicle expenditures, and library materials. <clears throat> and the majority of the under budgeted amounts were due to um, contractual services expenditures. Um, and these were under budget from lower cataloging grant awards, lower than budgeted hosting fees for the Biblioboard group purchase, and a lag in billings for delivery contractual expenditures. A second round of catalog, uh, cataloging membership grant awards will be made shortly, uh, but these expenditures will only be $14,342, which should leave Rails with $108,492. Um, that will remain unspent, um, a budgeted amount that will remain unspent for these grants. Professional services expenditures were under budget due to not having yet incurred uh, the budgeted expenditures for the Rails website redesign, as well as the bulk of the expenditures for the specialized cataloging project. The website redesign is now budgeted and, uh, and expenditures for this project are expected to be incurred in fiscal year 2023, and the specialized cataloging, cataloging project is extended into fiscal year 2023 at this point. 
The first of several uh, budgeted replacement storage servers was purchased in March, uh, but we're still awaiting delivery on the software for that server. The remaining expenditures for several additional servers have not yet been incurred, and the budgeted purchase of the five new um, delivery vehicles uh, for fiscal year 22 have been deferred until fiscal year 2023. Delivery department expenditures through April of um, a little over $3.13 million were $27,825 above budget. Um, nearly all cost categories uh, in delivery were under budget with the exception of vehicle and personnel expenditures. Fuel costs have, um, of course, as we all know, continued to increase despite the president's efforts to stabilize prices with the release of the fuel reserves. And uh, vehicle repairs and maintenance have increased during the past several months, mostly due to the aging of the rails fleet. Currently, rails has 18 vehicles with over 200,000 miles on them. Um, we're projecting that the fiscal year 2022 budgeted deficit of $480,167 will not um, occur due to some of the cost cutting mentioned above, including negotiating the pricing for the hosting fees with BiblioBoard less than anticipated um, interest in the cataloging membership grants and um, deferring certain purchases and projects such as the vehicles mentioned above. May I answer any questions? I, I think Jennifer has her hand up. Yes, and, no, and also uh, Haley Cox entered the meeting at 11.07, or 10.07, sorry. Jennifer, did you have anything? Okay. No, no, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you bad cues. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there's no questions, uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, it was nice to see that we had some uh, above budget. That was great. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, moving on to reports. Um, I will start us off with the, I have no report at this time. Um, the committee reports were included in the packet. Uh, the next meeting date for the consortia committee uh, should be July 18th instead of June 18th that is in the report. Uh, does anyone have any questions or additions uh, to the report as presented? Tom, I'll just assume we'll move Mark, and I'm sure all of you saw where the of the governor signed the amend, amendment to the local or the Illinois Local Library Act and Public Library District Act of 1991, which will, excuse me, provide um, waiving the non-resident fee for persons under the age of 18. And it also removes language in the Illinois Local Library Act, providing that nothing in the section requires a public library to participate in a non-resident card reciprocal borrowing program. And this was signed on May 13th and was effective immediately. Well, that, that's great news, Sue. That's great news. Any other comments <laughs> or additions? Okay, if none, uh, next up is the Rails Report and uh, Deidre. Thank you, Tom. Do you know? This little one is uncovered. Okay. 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 I don't hear it anymore. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see. You have my written report. Um, I wanted to just draw a couple things to your attention also in the Rails report. Um, the, um, th this is uh, particularly for Jennifer. <laughs> that we have um, uh, just uh, finally, we are piloting Explore More Illinois um, in an academic library. Um, this has been something that we've been working for, uh, on for a while. I think it is Illinois Central College. Um, the, the Explore More, yes, um, Explore More um, had been limited to uh, public libraries. Uh, it, uh, when we started it, just because we couldn't quite figure out how to manage the overlapping, um, you know, user, you know, client base, etc. But uh, uh, Jennifer, in particular, brought it up, and so um, they have been working on that. And I'm really happy to see that we were, we're expanding it. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the, um, the My Library Is grants that we're uh, doing for school libraries in particular. Um, the amount requested was nearly $120,000 uh, with a budget of $50,000. Um, so um, I think we're going to look at spending more than $50,000. We are so pleased to have such, um, such interest and you know we're all very interested in helping, well, obviously all types of libraries, but especially school libraries and advocacy. So uh, uh, stay tuned, um, all you out there, you school libraries waiting to hear um, whether your grant got approved. And um, that's all I really wanted to add. I am happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Can I just um, ask, uh, this is Jennifer. Yeah, can Jennifer, I ask, go ahead. is there anyone present who can talk about what the data and libraries networking group is more? Can you give a little more information about what that is? I saw that referenced in the report. Well, it's, um, I can tell you that um, uh, Grant Halter has, is, and Dan Bostrom are spearheading that. Um, and it's a, it's, it's new. Um, and they're, you know, they're just uh, meeting with uh, member library staff who want to talk about data. That's what I know. Do you know any more about it than that, Monica? I think the only thing I would add is that we've just seen a lot of increased member interest right. in data specifically. And there are a lot of libraries in the Rails uh, membership that have data specific positions. And so those folks are also looking to connect with one another to talk about like, what they're doing for their library, how to share information. So that's my understanding of, of how it came about. Cool. Yes, Thank there's you. There's a, a very uh, a, 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 just a growing interest in in data as as libraries. Well, I guess it's nothing new, but you know, libraries are seeing more and more how it can help them in a variety of ways: decision making, um, you know, advocacy, etc. Right. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to add, uh, Deidre, about the report yes. was uh, Monica's trip over to East Moline. That was oh, a very right. interesting library to uh, yeah. see and hear about the trials and tribulations of uh, converting the, an old bank building into a library. Uh, it was uh, very interesting. Yes. Uh, uh, Thank you, Deidre. Uh, next up is sure. Joe to talk about continuing education. Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Um, well, I'm just going to pull up a few slides here, but as a reminder, um, Consulting Continuing Education Department is a department of three. Um, let me just make sure. Can you all see my uh, my slide now? Yes. Okay. Um, so yes, we are Department of Three. Our model is such that we um, that we seek out uh, and contract with outside presenters uh, to deliver our CE content. So that is professional consultants, trainers, uh, subject matter matter experts here in Illinois and elsewhere, and then obviously our very talented members. And I think there's at least two people on this board that have been those people to deliver CE for us. Um, a common question, how do we sort of decide what we offer in the way of continuing education or pursue? And I kind of think of it as these four buckets that you see here. Uh, member feedback obviously belongs on top, you know, the, the sort of feedback that we get from our members about the kind of continuing education that's going to help them, um, which we get, again, directly through our networking groups, you know, as Dan and Monica and others visit our libraries, uh, they bring back a lot of feedback. Um, and then on also the evaluations that we do. Uh, just to give you sort of an interesting real world example of how this happens and what this looks like, it was only, what Monica, maybe a week or two ago that you ha had some outreach from a finance director at a library yes. um, yeah. that was, you know, thinking about uh, during a renovation project, charging systems for elect electric vehicles in their parking lot. And 
how this could really become a pressing need for libraries and the idea that maybe this could be an area for CE and they connected us to an organization that maybe could do that. That is not a topic that was on my radar that I was even thinking about, <laughs> um, but it's just a good point that our members are often the best way for us to learn what is of relevance and gonna, gonna support them. Um, so in addition to member feedback, obviously we're watching trends showcasing the sort of projects and initiatives that are going on at our libraries and else and abroad, um, what is being presented at other conferences and state associations, those external forces like a pandemic, like the census, like minimum wage, um, need to be responsive and also, you know, the rail staff and all of you as board members give us a broad perspective of the needs that you are hearing um so while i attend these board many board meetings um you know to learn what's happening in the organization i work for i've also learned i need to attend to like listen for my name because sometimes i may get assigned something to do i think it was just a couple meetings ago ali was talking um about uh, her special library and like the idea that we could um, maybe offer a program on that. So, so something Hallie and I talked about recently. So um, lots of different ways that we get these the sort of ideas. Um, being multi-type, you know, there's great challenge and opportunity, of course, regardless of what type of library our members are at, their, their needs are often the same, right? Or their challenges. I mean, we're talking about funding and recruitment, retention, advocating for our place. Um, and while the challenges are the same, the methods and strategies to address those challenges may take a different shape, again, depending on what type of library. So being multi-type in the context of, of continuing education, I think means that we are having to think about how we might offer CE that is going to speak to everybody, that's going to be useful to everyone, regardless of what library type they're coming from. But at the same time, we have to also recognize that each library type has needs and challenges that are unique to them and offering CE uh, that will address those sort of uh, unique needs. So just, you know, as examples in public libraries, obviously we've done a lot in the sort of HR and legal area, um, knowing that there's there's always something new and always something new that libraries are kind of having to experience or, or, or adjust to. Um, in the case of academic libraries, sort of looking back, I think that one of the most sort of, uh, one of the themes that we hear a lot is, is around assessment and wanting kind of some education around assessment. And just looking back, you know, one of the more recent webinars methods for creating and assessing library outreach initiatives was a webinar we did that was focused on academic libraries. That's just kind of one example. Uh, we know school libraries and particularly in our work with IELT, um, you know, supporting them and uh, around material challenges and offering um, opportunities and supporting their opportunities to offer education in support of school libraries and how to deal with those material challenges. And then for special libraries, you may have seen we're, we're offering a webinar uh, just in a couple of weeks on making sort of articulating the value of special libraries with Mary Ellen Bates, who I think Dan has mentioned her name that does a lot of great work for special libraries. Uh, you know, we don't exclude members based on their type. If we're doing a, an event for <laughs> academic libraries, we don't turn away a public librarian or a school library. And there's always opportunity to learn and particularly learn from one another and there are different types. But I think that if there's one area that we can still continue to strive to do better, I think it's still trying to offer more that is very tailored to one, to our different types of libraries. And I think working with those organizations like IL, SLA, Carly, IACRL gives us kind of a great opportunity to understand their needs and offer CE that's gonna be really, um, uh, you know, filling, filling a need for them. Um, I'll just mention, you know, in addition to the tra traditional standalone workshops and webinars that we do, there are different ways that we get training out to our members in addition to that. So it's partnering with organizations like IELTS, networking groups like Laconi, um, and even groups like the Adult Reading Roundtable that, that offer a lot of great uh, training for their members and for libraries, but that we can perhaps help them by allowing them to use our Zoom license or, or other ways. So there's that. There are the statewide initiatives like Directors University and Directors University 2.0, which is going to both of them happening this summer uh, over where Greg is, Spring, Springfield at the Illinois State Library. We're so, 
so thrilled to be back there after a few years. Um, and then, of course, in the EDI area, we'll be launching our, our learning cohort, the application and the information around that in just a few weeks, which is going to give an opportunity for members to go through kind of an eight or nine month learning experience together. Um, so again, in addition to kind of the one off opportunities, we want to also offer things that are more robust and, and more um, allow people to dig a little deeper. Um, so it's been, I'll acknowledge it's been a while since we've done workshops that look like this. This was, I believe, at the Naperville Library in 2019. Um, we know that there are great benefits to bring our members together in this way um, and to offer learning opportunities that have a, a level of engagement that maybe is difficult to replicate on Zoom. And as events like these slowly return to in-person, you know, we have Reaching Forward recently, Directors Universities in just a couple of weeks, and that will be in-person. This is why at Rails, you know, we're having those conversations of how we bring people back to Burr Ridge into that meeting room to do trainings like these, to go to our member libraries and offer workshops like this. Um, but I think at the same time, we do have to acknowledge that there is a level of um, inclusivity, I guess, that we get closer to achieving when we're offering things online that we can't quite achieve when we're doing in-person training. I mean, whatever location we choose to offer a workshop um, is automatically going to exclude a significant percentage of our membership based on where that opportunity will be. And at a time when we're all paying five dollars, you know, a gallon of gas and libraries are experiencing staffing shortages, not to mention lingering concerns of COVID. You know, we do have to ask the question, to what extent do we think we can fill a room this way? I think we still can, but I do think we just have to be intentional and thoughtful about how we balance this format with the format online that can perhaps give uh, an opportunity to so many more people uh, to be able to experience it. Um, as I wrap things up, I do just want to acknowledge that sort of other word in my job title, uh, consulting. Um, I think many of you are aware of our, our sort of structured consulting services, FOIA hotline, consulting directory, HR source uh, consulting, et cetera. But I think what has really grown over time is the level of outreach that we get from our members um, with requests for help, whether it's answering a question or just really wanting someone to talk through an issue with them or a challenge their experience. I mean, I think in my first year, first couple of years going back now six, seven years ago, I maybe got one call or one email from a member a week. Um, now I think it's several a day that we're getting and, and that doesn't include maybe questions that Deirdre, Monica, Dan and others are getting on staff to the point that we're really now trying to, to have a better system to track those questions so that we have a, a better sense of the nature of the questions um, the quantity and, and sort of the amount of time that we're spending doing that sort of consulting support, because I think it really has grown. Um, we talk about libraries articulating value to their communities, but of course, that's something Rails has to do for our membership as well. And while traditional resource sharing is always going to be our backbone, as it should be, I really want our members to see Rails as an indispensable source of information and insight that they feel that they depend on when they're up against a challenging issue in their experience. You know, I want our members to say, I could not have done this without the help I got from Rails. Um, and it's something I think that we should take pride in. Um, okay, there's always so much more that I could say and talk about, but I made assurances to certain people that I would be mindful of my time. So I'm going to stop yeah, and lead you, but also other high ranking officials in rail. So I'm going to stop, but I'm happy to take any comments or questions anyone has. That was a great presentation, Joe. And uh, I just want to also say or amplify that three people um, do all that. Uh, he gets a lot of, they get support from our entire administrative team and, you know, other high ranking officials, but, um, <laughs> but it is amazing what three people yes. uh, produce. And so thank you all for that. Okay. Thank you, Dee. And thank you for the opportunity to share with you all today. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I especially like all the uh, stuff that you can get any time online through the site as well that you guys have produced over time. Um, next up is Greg at the State Library. Good morning. Good morning. Um, 
good to see everyone today before the holiday. Um, I just have a few things and, and several of them have actually um, already been mentioned. Um, building on uh, Sue's comments regarding Public Act 102843 regarding the uh, service to uh, or unserved service to those 18 and under, um, we've had a lot of questions recently about, you know, administrative rules or what needs to be done. The law was effective May 13. Any library board that wishes to take action should go ahead and do so. Um, any administrative rule, uh, because this legislation was so straightforward, will really mirror what the legislation already says. I think it's important that libraries do have to realize that they have to take action to issue non-resident cards before this additional provision um, could be enacted. That is a, a frequent question that we have had that can they just do this piece of it, but that's really not the way that legislation is framed. Um, regarding House Bill 5283, which would allow public library districts um, to uh, hire a treasurer and also allows the state librarian a period for appointment of vacancies to um, board members in public library districts. We are still awaiting gub final gubernatorial action on that. Um, and before we make any further announcement, but any you know action by this office, we've looked very closely at what uh, the regional superintendents of schools and their role in this, because this legislation is mirrored um, very closely to what is allowed for local school districts. And we would see the process to be quite similar um, as that. Um, Joe just mentioned Directors University being here at the State Library beginning on June 6th. We are looking forward to that in person. Um, we were looking over the presentations of our involvement, and I think the State Library has a role every day with a presentation to the group, and, and it's something we enjoy. And then, of course, Directors U 2.0, which will come here in August as well. Um, we just made announcements for the FY22 Live and Learn Construction Grants. Um, those awards have gone out to the libraries and we will quickly be processing the grant agreements <laughs> and the payments. Um, as was mentioned as, as well, um, the comptroller is processing things quite uh, quickly right now. And we actually have the money sitting in the accounts ready to go for uh, the Live and Learn Construction Grants, which that is different um, from previous years, as, as the system would know, waiting for that funding. Uh, public library per capita. Um, we do believe this will be resolved next week. Um, and we know that many people are waiting. We answered questions about this, but when we went to do the final calculations, we realized there were about 20 uh, public library districts and they weren't those that had reached out to us ahead of time, um, that the service areas that were reported on the old Department of Revenue mapping project were incorrect. And um, that posed a problem in the calculations um, which the new mapping project and census data would do. So um, SIUE has been working closely with our office and our office directly in many instances with the county officials to get that corrected for the public library districts that were affected. But we do believe that is resolved next week. Um, and those announcements will be forthcoming. Um, and in the process, we're looking very closely at a number of applications for FY23, um, including what, you know, we will be ultimately reviewing for the library system itself um, for the funding for FY23. Um, we will also be filing at the end of this month, uh, the five-year plan for uh, federal funding. Um, for our state. Um, it is a process that every state must go through. Um, and we were fortunate this year, I think, because 
we had so much federal funding um, the last couple of years between the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan Act, and the ongoing LST appropriation that it afford us, afforded us the opportunity to gather a lot more input from libraries who were already grant recipients from this funding uh, to model how that might work for the next five years. So um, we will be doing that and uh, more to come on that as that uh, plan uh, is released publicly. So uh, that's really all I have for today. So I wish everyone a happy Memorial Day weekend. That's uh, very good news about the per capita grants. Yes. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. It is good news. We want it resolved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Greg. Uh, that was a lot of great information. Um, and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, moving on to Monica with the new Rails member. Thank you, Tom. Um, all of you in your packet should have a sheet with the membership background for Creve Core School District 76. Uh, I'm just presenting this today because Dan is on vacation, so he'll be back with you next time there's a new member. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about Creve Core, uh, they're primarily interested in joining Rails for the catalog membership grant. Uh, this would allow them to join RSA and to do interlibrary loan. Um, RSA has been working with the Creve Core Public Library on this, but as they were working on the grant, it came to their attention that they were not part of the library system. Um, so at that point, they reached out to Dan. Uh, just to let you know a little bit about the school, there are two schools in the district, but this is mainly for the middle school. Uh, the elementary school does not have a school library, but it is located directly across the street from the public library. Um, Dan met with Jake Yoakum, who you see on your sheet. He's the assistant principal at the middle school. And Jake indicated that the school is not only interested in the catalog membership grant, but also at the Illinois State Library School District Library Grant as well. Uh, based off last year's statistics, the district would be eligible for about $850 in school district library grant funds. And Dan and Jake also discussed continuing education, deals and discounts, other grant opportunities, including the My Library Is grant that he mentioned earlier in her report. So are there any questions that I can answer about pre four? Do we do we happen to know that this is Scott? Um, it says that they're interested in possibly joining RSA. Do we know? I mean, or do they have the funding for that? <laughs> That's I, I don't have a lot of information about that question, Kendall. I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't know if there's anything you have to share about that. Uh, I at this time no. Uh, I've been dealing primarily with uh, Greg, who is the director at the Creed Core Public Library, because. He is effectively the school library for the elementary school across the street, and also probably the one who will be filling out all the grant paperwork. Um, they, yeah, uh, so he doesn't seem to think it'll be an issue. Um, I have not dealt directly with the school at this time. They would be joining at our lowest automated level, which is, I think, $1,750 next year so. It's not super expensive. Thank you, Kendall. That's a, that's a good question, though, Scott, given our our ongoing conversations about sustainable um, a membership in LSAPs. So we'll. I also have this is Becky. I have a general comment. I really like how by us offering these grants and reaching out to specifically schools, because we've seen a lot of schools joining in the last couple of years and special libraries. Um, I like that because we have these things to offer, it brings them back to being members. Yeah. And that helps everyone yeah. if they're members. Um, it's nice that we can give them something. We can give them more than just money. As you said, Dan talked about all the other opportunities. But right. I, I just think it's important that we remember that offering these grants, even if it's only $800, helps us get more people into the fold, which is ultimately our goal. So, right. Great comment. Who would they, this is Karen, who would school librarians contact at Rails if they were interested in learning about them? Yeah. And just Dan? Dan Bostrom. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's what I thought. I mean, anybody. But <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Dan. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm only asking because um, my cousin just became a librarian at a middle school oh. library and she was calling me with a bunch of questions and you know i was having issues trying to answer her so <laughs> send her on over yeah 
I will tell you when I get questions, because I sent Monica and Joe an email this week, I'm like, I'm just sending it to people who can answer it and walking it away. Uh, yeah. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve Creve Coeur School District's uh, membership application into rail. This is Karen, I second. Okay, thank you, Scott and Karen. Uh, Emily, will you please call roll? Kelly Cox. I see you say, say yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alice Creason. Yes. Robin Hellenthal. Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. Chris Kenny. Yes. Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Becky Spratford. Yes. Beth Teppen. Yes. Alex Fancina. Yes. Karen Voidick. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. And Thomas Stagg. Yes. Okay, now we have 8.2. Um, the six month review of closed session minutes. And um, you got a, a lengthy set of uh, minutes uh, from uh, from many meetings were sent to the board uh, in an email on Wednesday. Does anyone have any questions or comments regarding those minutes? Okay, if, if there's no questions, uh, may I have a motion and second? Uh, To in the May 1st meeting, uh, I would have a motion to release the minutes of the of the July 30th, uh, 2020, 2021, but to keep all the remaining minutes closed as the need for confidentiality still exists for those minutes. Uh, can I have a motion to approve? This is Diane, so moved. Okay, thank you, Diane. This is Chris, I'll second. Robin. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Emily, will you please call roll? Yes. Alice Creason. Yes. Robin Hillenthal. Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. Chris Kenny. Yes. Diane, Ma I'm sorry, Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Becky Spratford. Yes. Beth Teppen. Yes. Alex Vincina. Yes. Karen Voidick. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. Ellie Cox. Yes. And Thomas Stagg. Yes. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and now we'll move on to item 8.3 uh, and the executive director search. Um, the executive committee met on May 19th uh, to discuss the executive director uh, search process. Uh, some changes were made to the job description, and Emily is sharing that now. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> Soon, Emily will share that. <laughs> Is that Emily Feister who's sharing that? Or is that <laughs> Someone named Emily, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Are you going to share it, Emily? Or I am. Trying? I'm getting okay. there. I, that's okay. I'm 27 just... pages of it. It's just... <laughs> so we're scaring people away. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So after some, after a lot of discussion, the committee agreed on two recommendations. One is to hire a firm to conduct a search for the next executive director. 
The other recommendation is to allow the executive committee to, ser to serve as the screening committee for the process of hiring the executive director. At this time, the makeup of the executive committee will change uh, when the slate is, is voted on in the July board meeting. I can, um, I, 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 could, I should probably add some. Uh, you have it now? Yes. No, I'm having trouble. Um, so um, after the meeting, uh, Mary Hudsby in, in HR did, and I did a quick timeline just to you, you know so, you know kind of play it out for everybody. Um, we think that probably the uh, you know we need to issue some kind of a request for proposal or you know something put it you know puts a, a, uh, something out there an RFI whatever to uh, get uh, um, you know consultant proposals search firm uh, proposals we we uh, and the, the executive committee is meeting again in June um, you know pending what the board uh, votes today um, and and so you know very conservatively we we're we're saying we can get this RFPI whatever issued you know by July 1st and I'm, you know, I'm very cognizant of all the board changes that are going on, that will be going on, you know, people going off, new members, um, new officers, uh, get the consultant hired by July 30th, get the job posted in August, um, interviews in September, maybe even in October, and then there you are, you're in almost at, July, at November when I'm leaving. So. I think we're, you know, we're we're good. We're, I mean, we're okay. We have time, but we don't want to delay at all either. So, um, so there's the job description. I can't read it. Yeah, it's really small. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there weren't, you know, this is a very uh, complete job description. I'll say, um, there weren't a lot of really. There was a lot of good. Thank you very much. A lot of good clarifying. That, that was done and, you know, in improved uh, description, I would say. Um, we did um, add, we did check in with HR source about the appropriate language at the end for physical requirements um, uh, for that, kind, you know, not, not much because it's a very, you know, sedentary <laughs> job apparently. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, so, um, uh, you know, I think it, I mean, I don't think there was anything that was missing from this job description, yeah. that's for sure. So, um, so that's what I have to tell you. Uh, I can, you know, there's there, I can, I can give you some possible, um, uh, you know, search firms. I'm sure many of you have heard of a lot of these. There's Bradbury Miller. I think that's, that's what they are now. That's uh, Dan Bradbury. Um, he did the search when I was hired. Um, we used them at LaGrange for our most recent search too. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, John Keister, of course, is, is local. He does, and I mean, uh, Dan Bradbury is not that far away either. Um, uh, uh, Diders and Todd, which is uh, Jim Diders and Alex Todd, um, uh, colleagues of all of ours. Um, HR Source also does uh, uh, searches. And I believe that they were just part of the ILA selection process. Uh, process. Um, when uh, Cindy Robinson, Yay. here, here, um, was uh, was promoted, <laughs> rightly and uh, appropriately so. Um, <laughs> congratulations, Cindy. Um, Library Strategies, which is in Minnesota, um, they do uh, search firms. And then I came across a, a firm the other day called Koya, K-O-Y-A Partners. They seem to do consortia, which is interesting to me because, of course, the others are all very, I mean, they do a lot of, you know, library searches, especially public libraries, and that's great. Uh, but I think the consortia angle is a good one. Now, Obviously, I have a question. Yeah. You. Sorry to interrupt. No. I'm confused because I haven't gone through this before. Sure. Um, 
of why you would need a firm, don't people just put in and then the executive or the, the committee that hires everybody talks about it and takes the best candidates from what they put in or no? This, what we do here is we go search for people and off, you know what I'm saying? I don't understand. It, it, um, so I, one of those approaches is sort of passive versus non-passive and this would be the non-passive approach. Where okay. The, the search firm is actually going to go meet the bushes and and actually reach out to people and say, hey, are, did you see this? Are you aware of this? Do you okay. Think good for this? Or, you know. Kind of like when you want to buy a house and it's not up for sale and you go knock on their door. <laughs> I mean, no, but, so I've done, to that. I've done two executive director searches both ways. One where the board led it and one where we used, we used Bradbury most okay. recently. And I will tell you, yes, that is, we got better candidates because we were, we were sending it out through Bradbury. Okay. But I will also tell you, and this is key to Dee's timeline issue, the search firm keeps you on track. They keep you... Um, because in our case, the set, when we used them, we were in a situation where our interim director was running out of hours because of his uh, retirement thing. And we needed to stay on track. Not only did they identify excellent candidates for us, but they kept us on track with interviewing. They kept us um, understanding the best way to do the process. They helped us navigate the board versus the staff component, because that's also important here, where both sides have a say. Um, I going through both and I led the one when we did it internally to hire Jeannie Dilger. And it was, as the leader, I will tell you, it was way better when Brad Harry did it. Like it was, it, <laughs> okay. this is what they do, these firms. And yeah, especially with our timeline and especially because this is a big job. Oh yeah. And we want to yeah. make sure we have the full range of candidates available. I think okay. it's, I think okay. it's a good choice. And an another and thank you for that yeah. exactly and that was a lot of the conversation at the executive committee but also um it, we have two people in hr <laughs> and, and they would inevitably be very involved in any if the board you know if there was no search firm and there's there one of them will be going on a, a, on leave at some point um that will be you know and you know family leave etc and um, let me tell you, as it is, you know, what with, you know, trying to hire delivery staff these days and they are stretched thin already. Okay. So I, I mean, I, I don't think, and, and they, we, I talked to them about this. I don't think they have the capacity as much as they might. Of course, they'll be helpful in every yeah. way. Okay. There's also, I think it's good to have some some, you know, a barrier also. Yes. I mean, you know, yes. just, just to protect the staff, I mean, because at some point the HR staff will be working for whoever it is who gets hired and, you know, they, they need to be able to be neutral, do you know what I mean, or be, and especially appear neutral. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that very yeah. thing, that the board hires the director. So it's kind of unfair to have the staff get involved in that because yeah, it's uncomfortable be situation six months later, where like, I heard you didn't want to hire me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. You know, yes. Yeah. You know. yeah. So for all yeah. those reasons. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. For yeah. Fine. Anyway, so. Um, so we have, I'm sorry, Tom, are we supposed to approve this process or is this, I, I have to go back to my agenda to see if it's informational or not. And I think uh, we're still going to. Possible gonna... approval, it says. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if there is any further discussion, uh, may I have a motion and second to accept the recommendations of the executive committee and to hire a firm to conduct a search for the next executive director and to allow the executive committee to serve as the screening committee for the process of hiring the executive director. So moved. This is Hallie. Thank I'll you, Hallie. Second. Thank you. Uh, Emily, will you please call roll? Yes. Robin Hellenthal. Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. Chris Kenny. Yes. Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Becky Spratford. Yes. Les Teffen. Yes. Alex Vancina. Yes. Karen Voidick. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. Kelly Cox. Yes. Alice Creason. Yes. And Thomas Stagg. 
Uh, yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Emily. Uh, next up, we have the unfinished business. Uh, the uh, approval of the APC grant application and FY23 budget. Uh, Deidre is up again. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so it's that time again. We do this every year. And uh, I am very, you know, sad to say that this will be the last time that I get to do this. It's really very, very sad for me. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's a, it's a, it's always a very uh, rewarding process. Uh, uh, truly, because we, you know, look back at what we've accomplished and what and what we want to do for our members. And um, it's been especially fun this year because we have had more money, which is amazing and wonderful. And thank you, State Library and Secretary of State for that, um, because it, you know, helps us uh, provide more services to our members. Um, also, having more money this year uh, was, <laughs> was a good thing we did get more money because costs went up incredibly, which, um, you know, we talked about last month, um, things that we'd like to do. And, you know, thank you board members for, you know, the reality check about being able to sustain, um, you know, services, both in terms of, um, you know, paying for them, as well as making sure that we have the appropriate administrative um, staff to also, um, just as I was, you know, referred earlier to Joe and his team of three, including himself, but without all the wonderful administrative we, uh, support we have from Emily and her team, we could never get everything done that we need to get done. And not just um, administration, but finance as well. So in any case, um, so I wrote, I have a cover, a cover memo here. Um, and then Sharon Swanson um, just, uh, wrote an incredibly uh, detailed um, and informative uh, detailed budget narrative um, about uh, our revenues and our expenditures um, for next year. Um, let me just say though that, um, and then, you know, I, we can go through this in any way you like. Uh, we can go through it, you know, page by page. We can go through it number by number. Um, but I just want to tell you in terms of the big picture that, um, you know, always when we do this, we are reminded, even though we remind ourselves regularly, that our main goal, as, as it is in the law, is to promote resource sharing. And, um, you know, that's that we do that in a lot of ways. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, traditional resource sharing of materials, but also sharing of expertise, um, uh, you know, e-read uh, e uh, programs like that. Um, but we, uh, it is important to, um, you know, uh, always bear in mind that there are libraries that do that cannot or uh, you know participate in resource sharing to the degree that they should, or or that we would want them to be able to for you know for the benefit of their patrons really they you know can't afford to, um, and so you know it it brings us back to uh, remembering that our three main goals really as we you know uh, provide all of our services are to find equity. Uh, to provide equitable services. So that means, you know, libraries that are large and well-funded, but also libraries that are, you know, are not and can't be um, the, uh, members of an LSAP um, as a prime example. Um, also sustainability to be sure that we can actually, um, you know, sustain all the things that we do and that are, and that includes, you know, consortia. And that's why we've been having the conversations we've been having at the consortia committee about, what to do about a um, couple of our LSAPs that are not um, as, as, uh, as robustly sustainable as we would like them to be. Um, and then obviously going along with that is good stewardship of all of our financial resources, all of our resources. And so that is why you have a very uh, you know, detailed uh, plan of service and budget in front of you. So, 
So resource sharing is the primary goal. Um, and, and so, you know, the, uh, as part of that, uh, Find More Illinois is a very important uh, program that is really growing now, is a, is a really important and complete alternative for libraries that can't or choose not to join an LSAP. Um, so we are expanding uh, staffing support for that in this budget, as well as um, uh, uh, expanded support for um, our, you know, communications and member engagement efforts. Because if we don't tell people, if we don't tell libraries what we're doing, then they won't be able to take advantage of it. And we heard this very loudly in our strategic plan, as I'm sure you will all remember too. Um, the need for us to do a to do research, really, and you know, gather data on on our non-public libraries in particular about why they don't participate or, or what aren't we doing that we could be doing. Um, and so that's a big, that's gonna be a big focus of, um, of member engagement. And then also uh, uh, as we discussed earlier, you know, the, the data analysis piece, the, the work that Grant and Jeanette have been doing on the school library uh, has just been an, an incredible uh, eye-opening to all of us who, uh, you know, ILA and Heartland, the, uh, the state library staff, um, ILE, you know, uh, you know, being able to really get a better picture of what's happening in school libraries and really be able to assist them. Um, and assist them in advocating for themselves and for school library staff is, you know, is, is, is really, uh, uh, we're really making some progress and we have to keep going in that area. And then administrative support um, for all of our services. And that sounds vague, I know, but, you know, what would the way that we, and it is <laughs> um, uh, purposefully, I mean, the way that we support um, um, not services administratively is we don't have um, um, people have projects, you know, and Emily can certainly, you know, talk about this if you want her to, but, you know, we have a team that works uh, for, um, you know, the, the team of administration, uh, administrative assistants, um, you know, work for everybody really, and they specialize in certain areas. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if we need assistance, you know, additional assistance in one area, we can, you know, put them over there, et cetera. So um, I, I do want to point out that, you know, we didn't end up having a budget deficit this year, which is this, this current year, which is very, you know, good news. And I know the board was very intent upon us making that happen this year, um, as we discussed last year at this time, and we did. Um, so then, you know, that brings us to the compensation piece um, for staff. So, um, you know, we looked at doing, um, you know, some benchmarking um, as we do every year or, you know, or check in with HR source on, you know, what the CPI is and what, you know, different, you know, um, things related to that. They, they said to us, don't do any benchmarking. Things are just too crazy. There's, you know, salaries are all over the place. Um, you know, rely on the CPI at this point. Um, and so, you know, what we hear from our, you know, members is they're looking at some, you know, raises maybe five to 7%. Um, as I put in my memo, Heartland is, is, has proposed in their, I think their executive committee approved, I don't know when their board meeting is, approved in a across the board 4% raise. So we've given you a couple of options here. Um, in the budget that you, you know, that the draft budget includes a 5.9% um, raise, but another option is an increase of 4.5% with a, a bonus to make up the addition, uh, you know, the remainder, which that wouldn't, the 1.4 doesn't go into the ongoing cost, but neither does it go into the ongoing salary of the staff. <laughs> uh, but it, it may um, moderate, you know, if the, I mean, inflation will recede at some point, we just 
don't know. I mean, I don't know if salaries ever actually go down. I don't, I don't know. Um, but um, in any case, uh, that's, I think, what I, uh, I will stop and happy to answer questions or if, uh, if you, if Sharon, if you have anything to add. You covered the highlights very well, Dee. Hey. Can I, can I make, this is Becky, can I make a comment about the compensation piece? Yeah. I will say that I was happy to see that in there because I, I know in all industries, for example, just the other week, my husband, he works for a large healthcare system and he runs a small office and they were losing medical assistance. You know, people who mm -hmm. provide the core of the work every day, people that come in and do all your vitals and all those things. And they petitioned to the larger health organization that they needed to do huge increases mm. for the staff. And they're also working then on the administrative staff next. And he's, he said from the position of the professionals providing the service, if, when they lose those people, yeah. it, is, it is devastating to the care of their patients. And there's where some of this, some people got 20% raises. It was so bad, yeah, but, yeah. um, it, but they evened everybody out and brought them up to even above market for their, for this area, just because they know they like their staff and are keeping them. And again, are then now going to do it for the front desk staff and everyone. And I think it, you have to do that in this climate because we're, everybody wants more services from us. And True. if we lose people, we can't provide the service. Um, and I do like Sharon's option with the bonus because inflation is an issue um, that won't stay forever. And that bonus allows us to compensate people and help them cover their costs. I mean, they're going to start driving to work more. Everything's going to go up. Um, and, but it allows us to compensate people for that extra piece without um, it going into the salary. So that's just my point about that. There'll, there'll be some additional savings this year with you know my retirement. Um, and even with all of this, we're, you know, uh, more than a half a million dollars under revenue. So um, I think, I think there's was, room to grow. I mean, my only comment is, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that Rails has the money to do it, to do this. But I, I always like to shine a light on, you know, there, there are various realities <laughs> and uh, public libraries, at least, that are in tax cap counties are looking at a 1.4% CPI this year. And that's not reality because it lags a year and a half behind reality. And the reality of CPI right now is seven, eight percent, God knows. Um, so the fact that Rails has the ability to come closer to the reality, good for them. Um, that that's an uncomfortable concept for many public libraries that Rails serves. Uh, so I don't feel good about that. Uh, but that's not Rails' fault. But it, it is. It could be seen as almost like glee, you know, on the part of Rails by all the libraries that can't afford to do what Rails can do. Um, so that's I don't know how we fix that, but it, it is a it is a thing. It's a fact of life that I, the libraries that Rails serves are not as well off as Rails. And even in Lagrange, where we're doing very well, we only could do a three percent this year. I mean, right. and that and that was you know that was with the tax cap and all the stuff. Exactly. Right. Um, but but the good news is. If Rails can keep good people, we can support the libraries who don't have as much money to do things. They can come to Rails for more. Right. There's there's no glee. Yeah. There's just a just, oh, there's I, a I just I I I, yeah. I know Scott and I I mean I I feel it. I feel your pain. I totally do. But I mean because let's face it, you know, we went 25 years without an increase. You know, it means systems. I mean, it went, yeah, down, 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 and you know, fewer systems, fewer systems. What would help that is some kind of a marketing campaign, marketing what Rails does for these libraries, because then they wouldn't say like, who are these people that sit in this really nice office area and get these huge <laughs> raises, and all they do is deliver books. I don't, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, valid, but uh, talk about what you do. Yep. Well, that's one of the areas we want to increase. Yeah, that's in the, yeah. Yeah. None of the other directors of libraries near me that I've talked to, you know, none of them think that. Um, but good, right? <laughs> but, no, but the regular people will. But when they see, like, oh my gosh, Rails is budgeting five point nine percent for raises. Dear God, I hope my staff doesn't hear that. 
like that's the vibe of library directors in my area like yeah, i know i i i do know i mean but but there's another vibe too oh, I know, yeah. yeah so and I, I i'm i don't know you know it's uh you know we're not a public library we're state funded um you know we get hit from the other i was thinking about it when sharon was going through the uh the financial report 20 million dollars in the bank you know and i remember you know it's 10 years 10 years ago now nine years ago whatever you know being criticized by member libraries for having too much money in the bank when it's that's that's it if we don't get it yeah. you know which goes to your point of course but still you know okay we have 20 million dollars in the in the bank but that's really if we never get any other money again that'll keep us going for a year or, or, or something and we we went through some of that yeah we we'll say we all went through that yeah, yeah. we only got two-thirds of our budget so you know life in the public sector is not fun and it's not there's always there's always something but um on, on the other hand we get more money we better do more because otherwise then we really look bad yeah. i'm also concerned with we have a big election coming up that will affect libraries in some way or another and so mm -hmm. to get proactive as we can while we can but we were going into an unknown situation is to what d is saying as well you know this is jennifer no idea this is Jennifer. I, I have a comment. I, th those market realities are the same in academic libraries too, because it's obviously larger institutional, you know, increases. I, a lot of my colleagues at other institutions don't, they're not seeing annual, <laughs> annual increases in their, in their salary. So um, that's a reality there too. But I think that Rails has another objective we can fulfill in terms of modeling out what, what best practices should look like. And of course, we aren't always able to do this, but when we are able, this is an example of what we should do. And that's that's using your resources for the right reasons. So it, again, it gives us a, something that we can model for our members, for member institutions to say, when you have the capacity to make, to, to support your employees in the context that we're all in, that's what you should do. So I, I feel like there's something. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, if not, may I have a motion and second for approval of the FY 2023 budget and operational plan as presented? So this is Scott. Thank you, Scott. Second, Alex. Alex, thank you. <laughs> Before we vote, uh, do Emily, we need to decide? Oh. Do we need to decide which compensation method we're approving? Yeah, is that an either or? The budget includes the five point nine percent. So if you approve the budget as as presented, then that's what we'll do. Just be increased, unless you want to do something different. Unless I you just thought you would propose two options in the, in the plan. That's why I said that. Let me ask this real quick. Um, it, personally, I think it seems appropriate for us to vote on yay or nay on the 5.9 and then leave it up to <laughs> Deirdre whether that should be all raise or partial oh. raise, partial bonus. Thanks. <laughs> to me, that's, I'm a kidding. So that's, a I mean, that's a good point because that is a that is a nuance that she should make, not us necessarily. Yeah, I don't think the board should be micromanaging to that level. No. Okay, great. All right. Sorry, so you're it's just as presented that. No, thank you. That's a, that was important. Any to, other discussion? You know, okay. Okay. Uh, if none, uh, let's, uh, Emily, will you please call roll? Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. Chris Kenny. Yes. Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Becky Spratford. Yes. Beth Tuppen. Yes. Alex Francina. Yes. Karen Voidick. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. Allie Cox. Mm -hmm. Did I lose Hallie? 
Uh, Alice Preeson. Yes. And Robin Hollenthal. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, and Emily, I vote yes too. I'm sorry, Tom Stick. You're losing Hallie through me. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh. uh, thank you, Deidre, for all that. That was very thank informative. You. Uh, next up is uh, Nancy George, uh, Rails Catalog Cataloging Services Coordinator, to give us an update on the World Language Cataloging Service Program. Nancy? Thank you, Tom. Sorry about all the <laughs> uh, technical difficulties. Uh, good morning, everyone. And my name is Nancy George, and I'm Rails Cataloging Services Coordinator. Um, so, um, I'm here to talk about Rails World Language Cataloging Services Program. Um, I wanted to mention there is a handout in this um, in your packet about this program. So I would like to briefly explain um, what this program is. Um, and I also would like to give you an update on how this program is going so far. So let me start with uh, why we started the service program. Um, Rails established the need for specialized cataloging support program uh, for Illinois libraries, especially word language cataloging and original cataloging through several surveys in the past five years. Uh, this year, we were able to um, establish a centralized cataloging support program to provide original cataloging and word language cataloging services to Illinois system members. Um, so it is funded by state uh, special grant from Illinois State Library. Uh, in the first phase of this uh, project, uh, Rails implemented a pilot project to test drive um, all procedures and processes of the world language um, cataloging services program. Um, five libraries of different types um, participated in the pilot. We provided a total of 14 um, bibliographic records to the materials for the project. Um, the pilot project finished successfully and we received great feedback from the participants and um, Rails fully launched the World Language Cataloging Services Program in the second week of um, um, January, 2022. So, What is this um, program? Um, it is a statewide cataloging services program. Um, this service provides supplementary cataloging, particularly uh, when original cataloging or word language cataloging is needed for system members um, as an outsourcing option. Um, this would be an ongoing cataloging support program and it is funded by the state library. So there is no cost to libraries to use this program. So I also wanted to uh, mention that this program is intended to supplement and not to replace um, consortia centralized cataloging service. Uh, who can participate in this program? Uh, both the Rails and Illinois Heartland members are eligible to participate, uh, and it is made possible by a grant from Illinois State Library, as I mentioned earlier, and there is no charge to um, system members uh, to utilize this service. So thank you to um, Illinois State Library. Uh, the, uh, we cover all languages that are considered part of library's regular collection um, as opposed to being a special collection. Uh, that means these materials should not be in your rare books or um, special collection department. Each library make that determination um, so uh, whether a particular title is a special collection or a regular collection. Um, as long as these titles are not designated as special collections, uh, libraries can utilize this service um, because um, cataloging maintenance center, CMC, is available to catalog those type of materials. Eligible formats of this uh, service include most of the print materials and um, print AV, I mean, physical AV materials, uh, 
um, such as this type of videos on this slide. And we do not cover um, electronic resources, digital collections, and special collection materials. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the cataloging maintenance center would be available to catalog those type of materials. Uh, libraries can send us physical items, photocopies, PDF files to uh, be cataloged. We understand that some of the materials are not uh, able to leave your library. So we can catalog from surrogates, uh, such as photocopies, scans, or images, rather than uh, shipping the original items. Um, so if the libraries are sending us surrogates, they should follow guidelines um, when preparing your library materials. Um, so libraries have to use a certain um, request form, that is the cataloging request form. Uh, when they submit the request, um, it is available um, on our website, and there was a limit of three to five items um, per library in a month to be cataloged. We recently made a change on this. Uh, now libraries can send us unlimited items. Um, uh, and also if they have a backlog of items, uh, we consider that as a separate project and we can work with the libraries um, if they have that kind of materials. Uh, we will consider those as a special project. One question I always receive when I did the presentations about this is the turnaround time. Uh, so uh, it all varies depending upon the scope of the collection and other factors such as um, what languages and what type of format they are sending to us. Um, and um, from our experience, we can say that um, the items will be returned back to libraries within four to six weeks. Uh, I'm not going to give you all sorts of procedures, um, uh, give you all the details about these procedures and guidelines you can learn from um, our website. Uh, here is the link and the link is also available in your packet. Um, the program highlights I wanted to mention now, um, members have shown great interest about this program and we received Great feedback from participants. Many participants uh, commented that it is a huge help to receive full records, especially uh, for items they cannot read themselves. So they are so happy that RealC is um, providing this much needed services for our for them. Um, so as of uh, May 11, uh, we have received 96 items from member libraries and. We receive requests from multi-type libraries, um, mainly from public libraries, uh, school libraries, um, and special library. Uh, 18 libraries um, use this service so far. Uh, additional libraries continue to inquire about this service um, and are preparing their in their procedures to be able to take advantage of this service. Um, we also working with um, CCS staff to establish a workflow uh, for centrally coordinating service uh, provided for provided to their member libraries. Regarding promotion, we pro widely promoted the service program through um, e news of Rails, Illinois Heartland, ILA, Carly, LSAPS, and um, different um, Rails email listservs. Um, I also did presentations at um, CCS, uh, Pinnacle, and RSA at their catalogers meeting. And I also did presentations at um, Rails uh, networking group meetings, such as uh, Rails Tech Services Network group meeting and um, World Language Network group meeting. So the promotion will be ongoing. <coughs> so we identified this program is helping Rails to achieve um, our EDI goals, um, this ongoing support helps libraries provide better service to previously underserved groups who have not had um, access to materials in their native language. Um, so um, regarding the grant extension and expansion of the service, um, as for the final quarter of the fiscal year, uh, we are underspent in all grant budget lines. This is due to a several month of um, delay related to 
cataloging maintenance center, expanding their scope of uh, their status scope of languages covered. So um, it was uh, resolved now. Once it was resolved, uh, we reworked our promotional plan and we were able to begin publicizing the program. So now we are seeing um, this project is quickly picking up with in volume uh, with increased cataloging requests as well as inquiries from um, different libraries. So uh, this grant period um, has been extended through uh, June 30th, 2023. And this um, allows us to fully expand the awarded uh, funds from Illinois State Library. So uh, with that, I am happy to answer any questions you may have about the service. Thank you, Nancy. Great to hear that there's so much interest. Could I ask a couple questions on that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, this is Beth Teppen, and I have a, a pretty wide array of languages spoken at my school. And so I've been trying to purchase books in those various languages and wonder if there's any way I could get some support figuring out some domestic vendors that I could use to get, you know, a wider array of titles. Like for example, in Arabic, I'm having a very hard time. Um, there are many Asian languages. I feel like probably just the culture is not a um, kind of a literature oriented culture. So mm -hmm. I don't know, just any sources like that that might be um, in conjunction with where these people got these materials. Mm. I would say we, I can um, research about this and send you a list, uh, but um, I received uh, this question before and I contacted, we have a um, networking group called World Language Networking Group. And if you reach out to them, they will be able to help you with that. But I can send you a list of, um, list of world languages our members have. So um, that will give you an idea to whom you would be able to contact. I can send that list to you. Yeah, we are happy to um, give you all sorts of cataloging help, uh, whatever cataloging help you needed. Yeah, but um, this, I know the vendors, the, the list of vendors is very hard to find nowadays. I received this question many times. Yeah. Does that help you, Beth? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I'll, um, I'll look into this networking group as well. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Nancy? Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, moving on to the meeting recap and agenda building for the next meeting. Uh, the next board meeting will be Friday, June 17th at 1 p.m. Uh, it will be the last meeting for a few of our board members who will be at the end of their terms. Um, Ann Slaughter will present on Find More Illinois. Uh, we will have a recommendation of the slate of officers from the nominating committee and a draft of scheduled rails board meetings will be presented. Does anyone have anything else that we need to add to the agenda? It is a week early because of ALA, just so bear that in mind. Okay. Check your calendar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have to worry about the time. We just have to worry about the week. This, this exactly. Meeting, so. yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, if uh, if no one has anything else, uh, we will need to uh, move into uh, closed session. Uh, the board will move into closed session to discuss matters pertaining to collective negotiating. As per five Illinois compiled statutes, chapter 120, paragraph two, section 2C2, which states, 
Exceptions. A public body may hold closed meetings to consider the following subjects. Number two, collective negotiation matters between a public body and its employees or other representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. So at this time, we need to uh, uh, drop many people out. <laughs> Hmm? We still have to vote. Okay. We have so, to vote. Um, I make a motion that we go into closed session. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, thank you. That was Becky. Yeah. Uh, that was Becky and Scott. Yep. Okay. May we, uh, Emily, can we have roll? Diane Hollister. Yes. Chris Kenny. Yes. Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Scott Poynton. Yes. Becky Spratford. Yes. Beth Teppen. Yes. Alex Vancina. Yes. Karen Voidick. Yes. Sue Busenberg. Yes. Kelly Cox is no longer here. Uh, Alice Creason. Yes. Robin Hellenthal. Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. And Thomas Stack. Yes. We had there are no actions to follow up from closed session. Uh, that being said, uh, it's, it's time to adjourn the meeting. Uh, thank you all for your attendance. Uh, I have something to add. Oh, we, news. Oh, that's right. We, on the on the on the um, uh, Bloomington Public Library on the uh, I believe it's the seventh of June, we are going to have our groundbreaking for our new expansion renovation. So we're oh, celebrating. Great. So we're so happy. So we have our that's wonderful. Congratulations. And then our um. The de dedication of the Lincoln Funeral Crane Wayside by the Museum Library and my husband and myself and uh, the city of Bloomington was a success. And even though the weather was nasty, we had around 60 people. So that was great. good news also. That's great. Awesome. Anyone That's else have any news? news? About Yeah, great news about the balloon tomorrow. What was that date again, Diane? I believe it is, I said second. I think it is the second. And it's at 10. I wrote this down. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's I can look it up and send it to anyway, everyone. I'll put it on, I'll put it online so okay. you guys will have it. Okay. But it is Tuesday. It's on a Tuesday, and whatever that is, the seventh, I believe. The seventh. So it's at 10 o'clock in the morning and we're shovel ready. So we've got All the right. bar out and you know, and then so very excited. Seven. Awesome. Anybody else have any new things going on at their library? Lots have, of hiring. Uh, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, attempt number seven in our referendum <laughs> on the ballot June uh, 28th. We're asking for a mighty fifteen dollars a year from the average home. Oh boy! Temp number seven. What do you think? <laughs> we're 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 leaning hard on the the nostalgia. We're a hundred years old this year, right. and and it's been ninety three years since the public approved an operating measure for the library. It, you know, ninety three years. Oh, wow. Yeah, Thank and uh, yeah. So I don't know. People just lose their mind about any tax increase and. I think is they don't believe us when we say fifteen dollars yeah. a year increase. They're like, you say that, but it'll be a hundred dollars before you know it. Yeah, like, <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> so June oh, work. Yes, June second. Yeah. Okay. June second. Who knows? Good luck. Yeah, yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You're not always cautiously cautiously optimistic. We only lost by 138 votes in 2019. That was that was. <laughs> Kind of wow. so touching. Yeah. But uh, that's brutal. Yeah. We'll get the library supporters to vote early. 
Because like I know I have to vote early because I'm flying home from ALA on election day. Yeah, so. yeah. No, the campaign, it sounds weird, but the campaign is almost over because early voting has started. Yeah. So mm. yeah, I've already voted by Yeah, we don't start till June 1 in Cook County. Yeah. yeah. Well, good luck. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. I know a couple people down there. I'll call and make sure they vote. Awesome. Scott, I know you're a White Sox fan, but you know maybe you need to bring the Cubs into it because you're getting close to that hundred year mark there. It's yeah. Ah. <laughs> I want to be a loser. Right? Thursday, get Thursday. it go, get it go. <laughs> and the Red Sox been killing you. They're not killing anybody else. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Any any anyone else have anything going on at their library? No, okay. Uh, if not, then uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. Uh, thank you all for your attendance and have a great holiday weekend. Uh, I adjourn this meeting at 1230.